Hello, Marina. Hello. All right, this is good. Okay. Hello, Caitlin. Hi, Mr. Warner. <laughs> Who is that, Shannon? <laughs> oh, hi, Leah. Well, I I didn't pick it. The class picked it. There there are lots of finals this week. This is this is a poor week to to pull the I've got test in other classes card. Okay. So what do you mean to pick the major? All right. Let's see. What? Thermo. Like together, guys. Test for you. Okay. For once, my computer's working. It's working. Woohoo! Yeah, <laughs> it's a good day. Oh, good. All right. Are you guys? Wanted to jump right in? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I have a sample calorimetry lab, but I thought I would wait a little while to get that started um, because there will be other people that will join in a little while. So um, maybe we'll wait like 15, 20 minutes to do that and I could handle or I could take other questions in the meantime. Yes. In number three A, why is the reaction simplified to ions? Uh, let's take a look. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, can you guys see the the worksheet? Yeah. Okay. So it has coffee cup colorimeter contains the 0 0.0375 moles of HCl. Assume that, okay, so write the balance rate equation for the reaction that takes place in the calorimeter. And they wrote the net ionic equation. Um, so. I think that. Um, Looking at this equation, <clears throat> it doesn't really matter that they wrote it in the net ionic equation. Um, usually, it used to be that on AP, uh, every question you came across, if it said write the balanced equation, almost always they were expecting the net ionic equation. However, I think that they're going to be a little bit more clear about that. So you could write in the net ionic equation or not. I don't think it would matter for this test. And on my test, it does not matter at all. I probably won't ask you to write the net ionic, but that's why that's the net ionic. That's the way that used to be. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Other questions? Really quick side note question. When is the lab due? Uh, it'll be due sometime in probably like January when we do our next lab. Okay. Making sure. Right, because I, I told you guys I was not going to collect the lab notebook. And so, um, since I'm not collecting it, uh, it'll give you some time to, to do it. I just would, of course, recommend that you do it now, that you have a little bit more time to do it. And, and it's closer to the actually doing it, so you'll remember it. Okay. Um, also on question three. Yes. For C. Okay. For the mass, they don't really use the mass of the water, and that confused me. They use the mass of the water. Yeah, but I thought it would have to be all of the reactants, like including the water, so... Well, yeah. um, let's see.
this is what I would tell you is that um, since the water and the the water and the coffee cups are considered together, I think it's interesting that they didn't c include the weight of the coffee cup. But when it says it says heat or loss heat lost or gained by the calorimeter. So in this situation, you wouldn't include the solid zinc or the HCl. Just asking about like the water in the coffee cup. Right, right. This is just just the water itself because, um, and and this will this will be explained a little bit more when we do the sample lab. I show you that. But the idea is that you have amount of heat that is absorbed or lost by the. Can you see me highlighting the jewels down there? Yeah. The heat or loss that, that's that's in this case it's the heat gained by the calorimeter. So that amount of heat was lost by the reaction and they're supposed to be equal and opposite in this ideal theoretical world. So if they are are equal and opposite, then from there if you have the um if you have the what what here they did is they went okay, well what is it in in you know joules per per mole or you know sometimes they'll do kilojoules per mole. Um which is you have to look for that a lot of times. That's another trick question that'll be on my test too. You know, find the find the enthalpy in kilojoules per mole. So don't forget that you have to divide it by the moles. But if they were going to find from here, if they were going to try to find the specific heat of zinc, um, which I don't know if they would, but if they did, they would need to <clears throat> do that Q. Uh, you know, the Q equals um, m CSP delta T. And if they're trying to find specific heat, then they would rearrange that equa equation so that it was like CSP right here. Is equal to Q over M uh, delta T. Oops, they they put parentheses in funny spots. So they would have the CSP is equal to Q over M delta T, and in that case, um, then you could find the specific heat of a substance. So you do not include when you find when they're asking you to find just the calorimeter, you need to find just of the water. And if they go so far as to say the water and the coffee cup, but a lot of times, especially when they're doing coffee cup calorimeters, they're just asking you to find. The water. Okay. And if the question doesn't specifically say kilojoules or joules, it doesn't matter what one we leave it in, right? You are correct. If the question, if it does not specify specifically what it wants, then you can do either one. Just be just be sure to look because that's right. one way they can trip you up. So we haven't we haven't had anybody else join us. Since we're talking about it, it would be much better if I just went into it. So I'm just going to show it to you guys, and if I have to come back to it later, I will. Amanda said she'll be a little late. Oh, well, let's just wait then. It would fit so well here, though. Okay. Um, I appreciate she won't mind. Oh, it'll be it'll be a lot better because I don't know if she'll. I mean, it'll just be better. Okay, so let's talk about something else. Like, how about the Enthalpy of the reaction where you have um, the reactions that you can, Hess's law, the ones you can flip around. And are there any questions on that? No, not for me. There'll be one of those in the multiple choice and there'll be one in the free response. Um, there will be a question... Oh, did I miss it? Uh, no, they start out with C. Okay, there'll be a question. So there'll be Hess's Law. Then there'll be a question about, not in this order, but in general. Here's another one like that, huh? There's a few like this. Wow, I didn't know I had that many. Oh, here we go. In number eight and worksheet uh, 13, um, where you have the delta H of the reaction and you have products minus reactants. That's going to appear in the multiple choice, and I believe it's in the free response. And um, I can ask you to either find the delta H of the reaction, or I might ask you to find the delta H of formation of one of the, like here it's the, the delta H of formation of ethane. They're not asking you to find it, but you might have to find it there instead. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So any questions on that? Like original 
like crazy and it's like the sum of the most kinds of products minus the sum of the most kinds of reactions like for every problem or if we write it like one we try um i think well on the free response it would be good to write it once um i don't know if there's many other i don't know if there's too many problems like that there might just be the one but um but I would say that that it would be good to write it once, just so we so as a as a reader they know where you're headed. Okay. Um, I would say this. Um, if you do the see, look at number ten here. That that they have the delta H of the reaction equals delta H of products minus delta H of reactants. Um, you could go from this. You don't have to write. You could do either either one or the other of these two that they have the product minus reactants, or putting in the actual formulas. You could do one or the other of that, but then definitely you need to do the third step. And then you could go to your final answer. Does that make sense? Or, yeah. Or ones like um, oxygen where we know it's going to be zero. Yes. Can we still show that? Can yes. Show Please show that so you, you are showing that you know it. And that, that, that you're telling the reader that you know that you, you're, that's why it's missing. Not because you, you accidentally came across it, but that you know it. And, and this is why you know it. Okay. Okay. Um, You guys know that when you have the enthalpy of formation, it's the enthalpy of formation of one mole of whatever substance it is. So you can have fr uh, fractions as coefficients when you're doing the enthalpy of formation of a substance. Yeah. Does that make okay. sense? Okay. Um, how do we know whether it's like kilojoules per mole or just kilojoules? Because I... Um, that actually, that question, ironically, I don't know if I'm using that in the right, con uh, right way, but, um, this past summer at the, the AP national convention at our, one of the chemistry sessions, somebody asked that question of the, of the, the person in charge of AP chem. And she said that it, and well, reader was there too. And they don't actually spend a lot of time paying attention to that. As long as you have kilojoules or kilojoules per mole, per mole they usually count them both correct. That is nice. I used to um, grade. I used to mark off if it if it was wrong, and um, now I don't have to. Hey, <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, because then I would like do the problem and then look at the answer key and be like, oh, those were all kilojoules per moles instead of just kilojoules, and go back and fix it. But I yeah. No. Why? So sometimes the 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 actually for some equations it doesn't matter. It's the same thing for others. It matters. Um, in this example, when you're doing, like, let's look at number, um, let's look at number, oh, I hate that. Let me back up. Okay. So in number 13, they're doing the enthalpy of formation values and they're finding the enthalpy of combustion of one mole of C2H2. So because it's one mole, you know, the answer could be kilojoules per mole. But in the question, it says that it's the you're getting the enthalpy of combustion of one mole, so it's understood it's per mole. So it doesn't matter; it's still kilojoules. That's why they won't mark it off. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now there are other questions though, where let's see if I can find one. Do they have one like at the beginning? Okay. Here, the, um, in number one, if you go all the way back up to number one, they have, you know, how much heat is released when 24.8 grams of blah, blah, blah. And they tell you the delta H of the reaction. It's negative 802.3. Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to get the number of moles of your substance. Once you have the moles of the substance, then you can multiply it times the negative 802.3 kilojoules per mole. And that's going to, the moles are going to cancel out. So your answer here is technically not kilojoules per mole. So that would be the exception to what they're saying. Like you shouldn't put kilojoules per mole because they already gave you the kilojoules per mole. You're just trying to find the kilojoules of oh, only if there's 24.8 grams. Okay, so since it's not 
one mole of a substance, you just put kilojoules. Right. Okay. Okay. Mm. Um, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so, the next thing on our list then, or on this worksheet, is the bond energies. So that is number 16. Um, so, number 16 was just saying that, let's see, turn that speed to the one. Two gaseous oxygen down to form a gaseous oxygen molecule from the table. Okay, so in this one, <clears throat> it's taking, interestingly enough, it's taking oxygen kind of in its elemental form, but it's zero right there. So there's no bonds to be broken. Um, so that's just zero. And then, so the forming of it is the, or the delta H of the reaction and the delta H of formation is basically the same thing, but it's so, so the, the O2, which is just that 499, but it's broken minus bonds form. So it's a negative 499. So the question is, is it, um, the next question they would ask is, is, is it, is it endothermic or is it exothermic? And you say that, or they might ask you, which has more energy, the bonds being broken or the bonds being formed? And you would say, oh, the bonds being formed because it's negative. So it has to be, it has to be exothermic. It has to, the, the bonds being formed has to give, give off more energy than is required to break the bonds. Okay. When we're showing problems like that, um, I kind of do like parentheses and like the element with the number of bonds and then like how many of them I have before I start answering numbers. Is yeah. that okay? That's great. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Showing that work is, again, you know, showing a clear pathway to the reader of what's your thought process and like how did you get to your answer is, is always helpful. And, and to be totally honest, I mean, the readers try to remain as impartial as possible. But, you know, after reading the same question for five days, if yours comes up and, they, and this is the fifth day and they're so sick of reading it and they can't tell what you're thinking, they might not give you as much credit as you deserve. Okay. This is really specific and random, but for like uh, delta H of reactions, like how is it the little like O or zero or whatever it is? Is that necessary or is that just... Um, <laughs> It's, no, don't worry about it. It's really, when, when it's there, that means that it's the standard state. And so it's like one atmosphere. It's, uh, I keep getting it wrong. I can't remember if it's, um, oh, there it is, 25 degrees Celsius. So it's one atmosphere and it's 25 degrees Celsius. And it's supposed to be, if it's, um, depending upon where you use that, that not symbol, Sometimes it means um, standard concentration of one molar. So in this situation, it's one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. Not to be confused with the gas standard state, uh, standard temperature and pressure, which that standard um, temperature is zero degrees Celsius, but this standard state for thermo is 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we don't need to worry about like remembering to write that or... Nope, do not. Okay. Do not worry about that. Again, I found out this past summer that the readers are a lot more lenient than I ever imagined. Um, yeah, so I don't, I, I mean, I want you guys to get in the habit of doing things correctly, but I don't want it to stress you so much that you lose sight of the big picture. Okay, so like for 12 and 13, when it says at 25 degrees Celsius, we, like, it's just saying that that's standard, and so it doesn't need to, like, play into our equation at all. You're exactly right. Okay. Okay. Right on. Um, be ready to draw Lewis dot structures. Uh, I think uh, I I think I have one on the test. For fourteen and fifteen, is that something we need to like know how to? Do. Let's <laughs> it see. Kind of random. Um, you need to know how to um, like for water something that's a little bit more. No, actually, you should be able to do this for anything. The um, like I understand what you're saying, but if you take a formula like, like here, I I think there might be one like it on the test, but let me let me put one on um, my bamboo paper real quick and show you. It's not too hard. Let's see. Okay, so um, 
So we're doing delta H of formation. I'll just call it not. And so let's say we pick something like um, uh, HC2H3O2, which is acetic acid. And so it would say, you know, show the enthalpy formation for one mole. So we want to know it for one mole, which means that whatever we come up with, it's going to be equal to that H2C2H3O2. And if that's the case, you have H2 as a gas, and the carbon in its normal form is just C as a solid, and then the final one is oxygen, and oxygen is O2. So, um, oops, I put H2. That's not what I wanted. HC2, okay, sorry. All right, so if that's the case, then that's H4. So that means there has to be a coefficient of two there. There's two carbons, so that has to be a coefficient of two. And the oxygen is just two, so you just leave it as one. And that's your answer. Okay, so for those type of problems, it would basically be just using H2O2 and then just C as a solid? Yes. Okay, so that's what I was confused as like, I'm used to forming water with like, H plus and OH minus. Right. So it was a gas. Right. And, and when we get to acid base, um, the acid base unit, you are going to be right on there. This is just one of those exceptions that's saying you need to realize that when they determine enthalpy of formation, it's from each individual element in its elemental state. And then you balance the equation based upon that one mole of formation. Okay. All right. Why did you put the H on the product sign? Um, this right here, uh, is acetic acid, which is really H plus and C2, H3, O2 minus. So that's why the H is up front of it. Okay. Um, so any other questions? I mean, I guess bond energy was the last thing we were talking about. Nothing so far? Okay. Well, let's go ahead and, and we'll go ahead and do the lab. I'll show you guys the lab and then um, I'll be happy to go back to it later. Um, I have already posted it on Schoology. So um, we can reference everyone back to that or I can put a, put a comment on there that if people want to go and, and take a look at it. So I'm going to show you this. And so I think that... Uh, I'm going to guess that, Caitlin, you've probably done it the most recently. Done what? Done this, the, the specific heat lab from last year in, in general chemistry. Did you have general chemistry last year? Oh, yeah, where was the iron in the water. And yes, that was the one. Yeah, okay. okay. So, um, so in this particular case, what we did is um, we gave you guys brown colored tubes that were metal and asked you to find the specific heat of the metal and compare it to this chart to find which one you have, aluminum, iron, copper, or silver. And of course, everyone in the class automatically knew it was copper, but we did the lab anyhow. So, yeah. So you do the lab and you find uh, that your the mass of your metal was 31.1 grams. Uh, and you're gonna put that into boiling water. And so let me show you, There's two. you have two things going on here. You have a, a boiling uh, beaker of water and you have your coffee cup calorimeter. So you put the metal into the boiling water first. So, and, and it's boiling, so it's 100 degrees Celsius. Um, and then you masked out the amount of water you had in there. Like you empty, you mass the empty calorimeter first, then you mass it with water and then you subtract it. And then you got, in this case, let's just pretend like it was 100 grams. So in your calorimeter, that's different. The calorimeter is different. So the beaker has 100 degrees Celsius water. It's boiling and there's a, there's a metal in there, 31.1 grams of it. And you're going to assume that the metal after like five minutes is the same temperature as the water. All that heat from the water went to the metal and made it 100 degrees Celsius. Then, and that's what these questions are. They're like super simple. Like where, where did the why was the boiling water was giving heat to the metal? And what happened when the metal was placed in the calorimeter? It cooled. I mean, it's really simple. So 
So the, the copper tube was taken out of the boiling water and put directly as quickly as possible into the coffee cup calorimeter. And when you did that, um, the temperature in the calorimeter, let's say it went up 2.27 degrees Celsius. Okay. And um, we knew the CSP of water was 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. Um, so when you, and when you did that, you could take, you could find Q. Q equals mass times CSP times delta T. And when you did that, the Q for that ended up being 949 joules. Like that's the amount of heat that the water gained. So if the, if the water gained it, then the metal must have lost it. And we would write it as negative 949 joules. Like that's the metal lost this amount of heat. It was supposed to be equal and opposite to the amount gained by the water. Okay. So since we have now the Q, then we can find the CSP and we rearrange this equation, the calorimetry equation or the specific heat equation to say, okay, we're trying to find CSP. We isolate it to one side equals Q divided by M delta T. And so the Q was um, going to be that 949 joules divided by the mass of the metal, which was the 31.1 grams and the delta T, which in this case, actually I should have put is a negative Doesn't look right when I do it. There we go. Okay, so you have negative 949 joules divided by 31.1 grams and negative 76.7 Celsius, degrees Celsius. And when you do that, you come out with the 0 0.398 joules per gram degree Celsius. And so with this data, we, we go back to our original table and we see that Copper was probably the closest as 3.85 than anything else that we had in that table. Okay, so let me let me just I am just gonna on the bamboo paper I'm gonna write that up so that you guys can can see a, a way to do the formula. Yes, there will be. Okay. Which is why I'm going over. Questions like the lab we actually did in class? Um, no. No, there won't be. Okay. Thank you. Sure. That lab, like like the idea of the lab is the same, but what they I don't know if they're doing this for the test, but do you remember how they had that Q of the um Q of the react or no no Q of the oh I can't remember now. Calorimeter? Yeah, but it was like the Q of the calorimeter plus the Q of the reaction equals the Q of the solution or something like that. Yeah. Anyways, that, that, that is the way they seem to be headed. Um, so I, there might be a question like that on the test, but they haven't done anything like that in the past. So it'd be very new. I think that I, I don't want to do anything different yet because I haven't seen what they're going to do on the test. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So um, we have this equation and the Q of the water is equal to negative Q of the metal. So um, because this one's negative because it's losing heat and this one's positive because it's gaining. So basically that's what we're doing. Like, so we've got the M, oh, I'm making that way too big. All right. Let's try yeah. <laughs> yes, really. So the M of the H2O times the CSP of H2O times the delta T of the H2O. Now, in here, we're going to say the H2O is equal to the calorimeter. It's the same thing for the purposes of this problem. Okay. So um, we have mass of the 
of the metal. I'm just going to put Cu down there because it's going to be easier. The Csp of our metal and the delta T. And, and we've got a negative over here. I forgot to put that in there. Of the metal. And what we're trying to find is this right here. So once you find these numbers, and, and, and none of these numbers are the same. None of them will cancel out. I'm not going to write a big, long, crazy equation right now because that's going to be, I mean, with all the different variables. But you guys get the idea. This is what it's saying. So you have to recognize that the water, that the heat gained by the water is equal to the heat um, lost or energy lost by the metal. So you find this Q, and then you can just plug it in here and say that the Q of the metal divided by the mass of the metal, which I'm just going to call Cu, times the delta T of the metal, wow, horrible, equals the CSP. And this is often what you're trying to find. Okay. So that, that has been a past test question. And I anticipated that it could be a possible test question in the future, so I am putting it on my test. Um, the whole idea is that you've covered it once in general chemistry and that hopefully you'll remember it and that my refreshing your memory will be, will be easy enough. Um, and the lab that we do is an extension on that and that it builds on those same principles. So. So there, are there any questions about that? Any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> so um, just some background too. I'm looking at doing about six multiple choice questions. And, um, and I would say that most of them are some form of calculation based. So you're going to have to be doing calculations without your calculator. Um, as long as you understand how the calculations work, hopefully it won't take you too long. And then there's going to be 17 points in the free response. Um, so, and again, most of them are calculations, um, but they aren't super complicated. There's probably, how many questions do I have? Like five or six questions with a couple subparts. So that way, um, I, I don't know if I, I think I thought I said this in class that like, you know, 25% of your test is multiple choice and 75% is um, free response. Okay, so it won't still be weighted like 50 and 50? No. Okay. I mean, well, it, it, every, what it is is that um, every point, the way that I've worked it out, when I say it's like 25% is this and 75% is that, like six Six multiple choice questions is 25% of 23 about, and 17 points in the free response is about 75% of that test. Okay. So every point is, is equal in weight, whether it be multiple choice or free response, there's just more in the free response. Okay. It makes it a ton easier for grading if I don't have to multiply each, um, each point by a percentage before I total it. Right, it makes sense. Okay. And, and I'd like to say that it looks easy. Like, I'd like to say that, I mean, I, I feel like it does, but um, as you guys often point out, I'm the teacher and I'm the one that wrote the test, so. But I think I've given you guys the right information. I know it's when we get back, but is it like gonna go into this semester's grade? It has to. I, okay. Like, well, I mean, I don't know how I would not do it in this semester, you know? Okay, good. Because, because if you did the retake, it's not like I can create, a, it would be like creating a yeah. duplicate score for you to start off the new semester with. Yeah. Did we pick a date for the retake? No, we did not. Okay. Um, after the test, though, depending on how you guys are feeling, and I'll have the test graded um, 
if, <laughs> if all works out well, I will have the test graded and entered before you take the final exam. So that way you guys know what that score is going in and you guys will know if you think you want to do the retake before we go into the break. So that way you guys will have the possibility of asking questions or whatever. I mean, not asking questions, but um, knowing what you have to study for the break. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. How badly will the final affect our grade? <laughs> I'm hoping it won't be badly. I'm hoping it will be goodly. <laughs> okay. You get to take, you get to, um, you get to not, whatever you, the score is gets added in, but then it also replaces your lowest test score. And typically, I, I, I can't say this with 100% certainty, but I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone gets a higher grade on that than their lowest test grade. Okay. So it it's would... Well, and that's, yes, it would just be, but that's what I mean. Like if, if in the past 90 to 95% of time it's higher than your other test grades, it's only going to bring your grade up. But yeah, if it ends up being your lowest test, if it ends up being your lowest test grade, then I will leave it as is. Choice, right? It is all multiple choice. That's almost harder. Um, yes, I can understand that. How how many how many minutes are in the minimum day? I can never remember. Uh, it's an hour. It's one hour exactly. Yeah. Okay. So that means that at the most, I can do fifty multiple choice. I probably won't. But I could. Um, I'm prob probably going to do between 40, 40 to 45 multiple choice questions. Yeah, it's exactly an hour. I looked in the planner. Okay. So, yeah. So, I figure that, that well, I'll probably make it like 40, 40 multiple choice because that will give us time to get in and get settled a little bit. Um, and that way, uh, you guys will have a little bit of, I mean, just you won't have to start right when the bell rings. You guys have a couple minutes to get settled, but then you'll jump right into it. Yay. Yeah. It's going to be all good. I can feel it. This time ever. <laughs> this isn't super relevant, but are we going to have homework over break? No. Okay. I used to do homework over the break, but um, it I don't know. I just, I, 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 I listened to a few of the other teachers in the AP community and they made a good point about like, I don't really want to, I don't want to have to grade papers over the break. So why would a student want to have to do work over the break? Like that doesn't seem fair. So, um, and with the, the fact that we don't have any more, like we used to have students take the class who had never taken chemistry before. And that made it really hard. Like students then had to like, especially the students who, who didn't have, um, that chemistry background had to do work over the break and stuff. And so, because we don't have enough minutes otherwise. So, uh, but it's doing better now, so. Are we gonna like do stuff the first day that we get back? Oh, well, yes. Well, because it's a thunder day. It is a thunder day, but, so probably what we'll do is. Um, have like a welcome back party. No, not a chance. We're gonna jump right into the next unit. I'm not giving you homework over the break, but every minute we're in class, we need to be doing something. Oh, thunder! Like you, you, you have like all your classes in one day. All like eight. Why are we doing that? They do it at the beginning of every semester, and I really don't know why. Well, this is an odd number of days in the first semester and an odd number in second semester, so you have to have like an even number of blue and silver classes. So they throw in a thunder day, which is useless. And there is the exact. That's exactly right, Caitlin. Thank you. It was interesting though, because last year we had an odd number in the first semester, but we had an even number in the second semester. Was it last year or the year before? I think it was the year before. You're, you're right, year before. Because, because I had Whitney students in my AP Chem class. And so it totally messed up our schedule because they had to come over on certain days. So during the first semester, they were on a blue day they came over. And then 
in second semester, it was a silver day because we didn't do the thunder day at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the second semester because there was an even number. But but the Whitney administration really wanted to do a wildcat day and have all the classes again. So what they ended up doing is they had that wildcat day. And then what they had to do is the like the first day of finals week, they had to have another wildcat day. So it's like having two thunder days in the same semester just so you could get back on track. It was weird. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that, so Caitlin's right though. The main point is that there's an odd number of days. They want the Thunder Day so that we can even it out with our blue, silver all alternating schedule. And then um, it would be, I, I think they do it on purpose so that there's an odd number of days in the first semester. I don't know what happened second semester, but um, the other reason they want an odd number so that the first day, so that you do see all of your teachers on the very first day of school. Second semester, I don't think it matters as much, but, but now that we have an odd number in the second semester too, that's why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. All right. They're, they're so exhausting. Yeah. So anything else? No. Well, if there's nothing else, I think we should wrap up. The Google Hangout thing for the finals on Wednesday, right? That's correct. <laughs> we'll do that and uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to have a study guide. But I will. But I would suggest you go back to all the practice exams and take a look at them. Okay. And then I'll answer whatever questions you guys have. All right. And I will try to take an. I, I'm going to try to take an equal number of questions from every unit. <laughs> so, what is that? We've had. This is our. Is this our sixth unit? Yeah. No. Yeah. So they'll. If six into. 40 about so that'll be like six questions or so six to seven questions per unit mr warner guess what what the final is not on the same day as the calculus test no how is that possible for the first time ever on the day actually no the second time that is crazy that's awesome but there's both of them are on tuesday so you lost the point oh sorry shoot <laughs> Well, it'll be it'll be interesting. Um, I, I think that uh, I don't I don't think it'll happen that way in the in the spring semester because I think that we have our actual tests on different days and things, and there's no CST testing, so we have like an extra week so we can space it out if need be. There's no CST testing. What? Um, the uh, you didn't hear they took away all of the CST testing except for the leaping frog test and like some other test. The juniors still wait. The juniors still have to do some CSTs, I think. But yeah, so so we don't have that week anymore. So there's so we can so like and and bummer for the seniors. You don't have that day that you get to sleep in like an extra three hours. Yeah. So we'll have like real school days, I think. And so we'll get to we won't I won't have to chop my curriculum. It'll be nice. All right. No other questions? No. Okay. All right, you guys. Good night. See you guys tomorrow. Or, no, Tuesday. All right. Bye.